Well, so welcome. Hello. We understand you had a long commute, so right. we appreciate you being here. <laughs> Um, and uh, I, I will introduce Dr. Siraj first um, as the vice chair for DEI for the Department of Medicine um, and a professor in the Division of Infectious Disease. And Dr. Siraj will introduce you. Thank you very much, uh, Lynn. Uh, I was uh, the backup speaker, so I, I didn't sleep yesterday because I was so afraid that tonight would not make it. So. Uh, Doctor, uh, it is a great pleasure to introduce our global uh, health speaker, uh, uh, Prof Professor Sanayit Fasaha. Professor Sanayit Fasaha is globally uh, recognized leader in reproductive health and rights. She currently serves as a director of global programs at the Susan Thompson Buffett Foundation, as well as the chief advisor to the director general of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros Adhanom. After receiving her MD and JD degrees from the Southern Illinois University School of Medicine and the School of Law, respectively, she went on to the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and did her residency in OBGYN and fellowship in endocrinology and fertility. Dr. Fisaha stayed there as a faculty and eventually became the chief of uh, the Division of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility. She has been the medical director of the University of Michigan Center for Reproductive Medicine and also founding executive director of the Center for International Reproductive Health Training CERT. Through grants and donations that she secured amounting to over 50 million US, uh, she founded and supported a number of training centers throughout Africa. With this, she has transformed maternal and child health care in Ethiopia, Ghana, and Rwanda, among the many that I know. For her work in 2018, uh, the New African Magazine has named her actually one of the top 100 most influential Africans. Her award honors are too many to list here, uh, but the, the two that stands out to me at least are the WHO Distinguished Service Medal and the University of Michigan uh, Bicentennial Alumni uh, Award. She has numerous publications and book chapters and her uh, and uh, presentations as invited uh, speaker. A year back, she moved with her family to Rwanda and she's now working uh, from Rwanda, giving even more to the continent that she cares deeply, really embodying a global health person. Uh, <clears throat> on a personal note, I know Professor Sanait uh, for over two decades through our global health work. Uh, we worked actually together uh, in 2004 to open the first uh, free HIV clinic in Ethiopia. Uh, so it is, it is an honor uh, to have you here. I, and I hope you'll join us in person at some time. And the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Professor Siraj, for that very kind introduction. And I can't believe it's been almost uh, two decades uh, since you and I embarked on this journey, uh, not knowing what the future holds, but I, I must say I'm in awe of the work you're doing and your unreserved uh, and steadfast leadership in, in global health. And also grateful to the Department of Medicine for inviting me. Uh, academic medicine is uh, sort of my, my uh, DNA, uh, and I, I now have shifted and I do miss it, but I'm really thrilled to be here with all of you today as such a pivotal moment uh, in global health. You know, we have now been, next slide please, we've now been living through a global pandemic for almost two years. Uh, this crisis has appended our lives. It has changed how we live, how we work, how we communicate. Um, you know, those of us who are used to traveling for the majority of our time have now stayed home more than ever before. And, you know, in academic institutions like the University of Wisconsin, the pandemic has interrupted clinical services, teaching and research as we've known it. And in hospitals in the US and around the world, healthcare workers um, have been overwhelmed and overworked. So COVID-19 has brought global health to everyone's backyard. It's no longer that thing that you know, we, we don't care about that is far away, does not care about the lines we have drawn between nations 
and nationalities, between health issues or between ideologies. Um, as we have all experienced, the virus knows no borders. Um, but while we've been impacted by the pandemic, it's very clear that the extent of its devastation has not been the same uh, to everyone. You know, it has uh, COVID-19 has deepened inequalities of all kinds from wealth uh, to gender and race. And, you know, as we know, an additional 31 million people were pushed into extreme poverty due to this pandemic. And sadly, most of them are in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, women have been hit harder by the social and economic impact of COVID-19. Um, in the U.S. alone, you know, education, the U.S. education system, Black and Latino third graders, for example, have experienced double the learning loss as that of white and Asian American students. The pandemic has also revealed how many of our systems and institutions like those in global health are really broken in their current form and, and, and often perpetuate inequities. There is no doubt this crisis has disrupted almost every aspect of our world. Yet times of great disruption like we are in today are also opportunities for radical transformation. You know, despite causing incredible hardship, COVID-19 can be a sea change moment for global health and for academic institutions like that of yours that have been entwined in the field since the beginning. Now, you may be asking me how. Um, I hope that by the end of our time together today, you will have thought critically about the question and in a few others, you know, how can we fix our broken systems? How can we transcend the borders of the past and chart a different path forward? What is our responsibility as healthcare providers, as physicians, as researchers, as medical students in building a more equitable world for the future? But before we talk about the future, I would like to reflect on where we have been. When we look at, at the history of global health, we can see how deeply inequity is embedded in it. I know these are hard topics to talk about, um, but colonialism, white supremacy, and a lot of forms of inequality are really deeply baked in the field's foundation. Originally, for those of you who are practitioners and students of global health like I am, we all know that global health focused on the study and prevention of infectious diseases. And it was not often about the communities, right? It was rather to advance the state interest and for the benefit of colonial powers. Early public health successes were driven by equality or by a moral imperative to create health successes, but they were rather driven by trade or economic incentive. Um, as, as you can see for on the slide, you may say, you know, where is this? But this is the first attempt, a picture from the first attempt to build the Panama Canal that failed because tens and thousands of workers died from yellow fever and malaria. The United States was finally able to complete only after implementing strict malaria control measures. They did so to great success. Yellow fever was eradicated and deaths from malaria decreased dramatically. But this only happened after the health workers directly influenced commerce. So these power structures are the legacy of global health. The legacy is also evident in terms used to describe the field over time. Global health as we all know it today is the child of what used to be called colonial medicine and later changed into tropical medicine, subsequently international medicine, and now global health. 
the evolution reflects the changing priorities of the field throughout history. Today, global health is focused on health and well being broadly. Many who go into it, including myself and many of you in this room, my colleague, Professor Siraj, many of us enter this field, do so with the noble goal of addressing deeply held health inequities. But one thing is clear, global health has always meant solving problems elsewhere. It has never referred to places like the United States and Europe, despite the many health inequities that exist in our backyards. Let's start looking at not far from your own campus in Wisconsin, you know, Madison, to see the disparities that are unfolding today. You really, frankly, don't have to look far. You know, early in 2020, many thought COVID-19 would be the great equalizer. That prediction, unfortunately, could not have been further from reality. You know, the pandemic has hit the most vulnerable and the most marginalized the hardest. You know, for example, Black residents in Wisconsin have more than double the COVID-19 hospitalization of their white counterparts. Indigenous Native Americans are 1.5 times more likely to die and Hispanics and Latinx population have 1.6 times greater case rates of COVID-19. And if we start looking at COVID-19 vaccination rates, here are also lower in communities of color, black residents, and nearly, if you look at the African-American population in Wisconsin, they are half as likely to be vaccinated compared to white residents. So this is your home. Uh, this is happening in your backyard. And whenever we talk about global health, we don't think about these things. And if we look at the US as a whole, black people, African-Americans account, people of African descent, account for 30% of the death, 34% in fact of the deaths from COVID-19, despite making up only 12% of the total population. And globally, the inequities of this pandemic are similarly jarring. There are also subsets within these communities. Um, if you look at women and girls around the world, they are the ones that are disproportionately impacted by the crisis and have suffered even more greatly. There have been attacks and restrictions on essential health care, including family planning and safe abortion around the world. Uh, in the United States, as you all know, this has been brought to the forefront. You know, in 2020 alone, an estimated 12 million women have lost access to contraceptive services, resulting in millions of unintended pregnancies and thousands of preventable maternal deaths. The economic impact of the pandemic has also impacted women more, threatening the progress we've made on gender equality. For those of you who've seen the recent McKenzie analysis, women job loss rate from the pandemic are nearly twice as high that of men. Women account for 39% of global health workforce, but they make up 50%, 54% of the job losses to date. And as more people were forced to stay home due to lockdowns and travel restrictions, all types of violence, sexual violence, gender-based violence, against women and girls have increased dramatically. This inequity also uh, manifests in other areas, including the rollout of COVID-19 vaccinations. The most powerful tool we have to date to combat, to combat this pandemic has shown a harsh reality on the power dynamic between high and low income countries. This map in front of you shows how vaccines have been distributed around the world. You know, in your state of Wisconsin, over half of the population has been fully vaccinated. But where I am today in Rwanda, along with my family, just one in 10 people have access. And, and Rwanda is a success story. If you look at the broader population of Africa, 
uh, it is less than 3% that is vaccinated. Even before vaccines were available, uh, Dr. Tedros, the Director General of the World Health Organization and other world leaders warned us of this possibility that this indeed will happen and could happen if we don't act differently, if we don't act more equitably. And despite this repeated calls for equitable vaccine distribution, the, switch, the situation played out in a predictable way when the vaccines actually became available. You know, high income countries quickly brought doses, numbers that far, far outweighed their populations, you know, keeping them in the stockpiles just in case they are needed for the future. Leaving other countries like my home country of Ethiopia, Rwanda, many of the developing world largely shut out from accessing vaccine. So today, while 60% 60, 60 of people in high income countries have received at least one do dose of the vaccination, about 3% of people in low income countries have. I'm sure you all are aware, uh, President Biden recently announced on the vaccine summit, a goal to fully vaccinate 70% of the world by September, 2022. An incredibly laudable, an ambitious goal, but the outcome is unlikely. Projections estimate that vaccines will not be available in most African countries for the entire population, probably not until 2024. This is why wealthy countries have a large enough supply that they're throwing vaccines away. For example, just since March, the United States has wasted over 15 million doses of mRNA vaccines. In fact, one recent analysis estimates that by the end of this year, wealthy countries will have 1.2 billion doses surplus of COVID-19 vaccines, even after vaccinating children and giving the booster shots that we've been debating. So, to echo the words of my friend and colleague and compatriot, Dr. Tedros, this is what he calls a catastrophic moral failure. However, this is not just about doing good. Our lack of global solidarity, solidarity is also self-defeating. The Economic Intelligence Unit estimates that delaying global vaccine rollout will cost the global economy over 2.3 trillion between 2022 and 2025. This will impact everyone, but especially the poorest countries. And of course, Sub-Saharan African countries will register the highest percent share of losses, about 3% of their total estimated GDP. But beyond the economic fallout, delays in global vaccination will also impact our ability to control the spread of the virus here in the United States. You know, until everyone is vaccinated, the virus will continue to mutate. And the good thing is this is a crowd that knows this. Not everyone gets the rationale why it is important to vaccinate everyone. You know, new strains could be more contagious, evade our, our immune defenses, and then and, and break through our vaccines. The Delta variant, you know, has ripped through the US and much of the world, finding high efficiency within the unvaccinated. But the Delta variant will not be the worst one to emerge if we do not change the story. At the end of August, uh, the World Health Organization added, added another variant of concern, the mu, to the list. So the best way to combat this variance and this pandemic will be to vaccinate everyone around the world with one or two doses of the available vaccines instead of talking about multiple booster doses for those who may be at a potential higher risk. So to do so, we must massively increase production of the vaccines, not just in the US, but around the world. We cannot 
solely rely on, on wealthy nations in this effort. You know, we now have an opportunity to strengthen vaccine manufacturing and delivery everywhere, including in Africa, you know, on this continent of 1.2 billion people. Currently, there are fewer than 10 African manufacturers, not with COVID, but gen general vaccine production capabilities. And even these facilities are limited to few steps in this process. Usually it's sort of kind of fill and finish. Um, you know, before the COVID-19, Africa produced less than 1% of the vaccine used across the continent, despite having 13% of the world population. Worse, even when vaccines are made by African manufacturers, they do not necessarily benefit their own population. I'm sure many of you have seen the story of a South African manufacturer that was bottling and packaging millions of COVID-19 vaccine um, that were then shipped to Europe, even as the Delta variant devastated the South Africa's health systems. Sadly, South Africa had no choice in this matter. Uh, as a part of their contract with Johnson & Johnson, they were required to waive rights to impose export restrictions. Uh, I remember the health minister said they had no leverage whatsoever to refuse the stipulation. stipulation. They could either sign the contract or not receive vaccines. So such power imbalances in global health are not just symbolic inequities. They have tangible and very, very dangerous impact on the health and well-being of communities. They also reflect who's in charge. You know, a glance of who governs global health reveals how prominent this unequal power dynamic is within the field of global health. Shockingly, few people from low and middle income countries, especially women, lead global health organizations. As you can see from the slide, high income countries make up 17% of the population, and yet they hold 83% of global health leadership. <laughs> and, and, and to make it worse, 50% of this just come from two countries, the US and the UK. You can see that women from low and middle income countries make up only 5% of global health leadership. So it's not that often that I find myself as being the only one in the room. You know, in recent years, there have been scrutiny on this power structure and how they can worsen the very problem global health aims to address. This is a very important step. We must reassess our leadership model. However, Efforts to decolonize global health will make little difference if we do not address other things that hold us back, such as patriarchy, racism, misogyny, that are really prevent in all of our systems. The pandemic has shown us with a vivid degree of clarity how much work we have to do the, to really truly root out this deep inequities. We're going to need to have radical changes. So I told you oftentimes I'm the only one in the room uh, as a black woman, as an immigrant, as an African who has spent the majority of my career in the United States. I have firsthand experience with many of the injustices that I have highlighted today. I was born and raised in Ethiopia where the path for many people in particular for women were relatively narrow. It was not uncommon for women to die in childbirth, uh, have early marriage, experience female genital mutilation, experience teen pregnancy. And women had relatively few options available to them, either to control their body or to have career choices. So that was the reality I grew up with. And it was this experiences frankly, that led me to focus my life's work on women's health and women's rights, a field that seeks to address the oppression, lack of dignity, and lack of choices that I saw around me. 
I was very lucky to have the opportunity to study in the US um, where I trained as a reproductive endocrinologist and a lawyer. But it was through this work that the stark reality of inequality, of racism that impacts our health outcomes in this country became frighteningly clear to me. In the US, you know, black women in the United States today suffer from pregnancy related mortality rates that are over three times higher than the rate of white women. And this gap persists regardless of income or education level. For women with a college degree or higher, in fact, black women have a five times higher pregnancy related mortality rate compared to white women. So even the privilege of living in a rich country or achieving higher education does not protect a black woman like me from dying from largely preventable causes. As a society, we've long demonstrated an underlying tolerance for inequity. But accepting the status quo only fosters an environment where more oppressive policies can develop. Earlier this month, Texas implemented draconian and dangerous restriction on a woman's right to control her own body. The law amounts to a near complete ban on abortion in the state. This is not progress. Frankly, this is not why I left Africa and migrated to the United States 30 something years ago. The US is trending in the wrong direction. And to change our course, we must transform ourselves and the system around us, especially if we believe in the interconnectedness of the world and we become global health practitioners also at home, considering the United States to be part of the globe. So I know this picture seems bleak. I shared the statistics and stories with you not to demoralize you or the aim is not uh, to, to make you lose hope. The aim is to do the opposite. This facts and figures should motivate you, especially the young people in the room, the medical students, the residents, the junior faculty, you know, but with so many layers of injustice around us, where do we start? Where do we go from here? So today, I really would like to emphasize that there are reasons for hope, despite the hardship, the loss, the injustice of the past few years that, that, that you know, the injustices have been there, but that the pandemic has shown light. I truly feel there is a greater momentum for change now that I have seen in my lifetime. So allow me to share a few events that have made me feel hopeful. The first is the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, in 2020, tens of millions of people around the world and the United States protested after the murder of George Floyd making it the largest civil movement in US's history. This was also not isolated just to US, right? People around the world used, you know, this became a catapulting moment. People spoke out against br police brutality and racism. You know, in, in the wake of the protests, you know, President Biden, for the first time in US presidential history, made advancing racial equity a priority for his administration. This is monumental. And in 2021, Black Lives Matter was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. For me, this is progress. The second point I would like to make is the recent Supreme Court ruling in Mexico. They, I mean, can you believe Mexico, a heavily Catholic country, decriminalized abortion, a tremendous victory for women in the country who have spent years, years after years protesting for their basic rights. So in that ruling, uh, Judge Zalviar, the Chief Justice said, now begins a new path for freedom of clarity 
of dignity and respect for all pregnant people, but above all for women. Today is one of the more, one more step in the historic fight for their equality, for their dignity and the full exercise of their rights. So that unanimous decision will likely have ripple effects around the entire Latin American region where abortion remains illegal in most countries. But frankly, I'm hoping it will spill over. It will also give a chance for women in Texas, especially the poorest of the poor, the most vulnerable where they have nowhere to go potentially cro can cross the border. We know how medical tourism works. So the winds are changing and it's leading to palpable impact. A more diverse and inclusive group of people are leading it, not just in the streets though. If you look at Africa, the continent I call home, African leaders have also stepped up and exhibited global leadership throughout the pandemic, strengthening African institution and supporting African-led solutions in addition to the leadership that we see of Dr. Tedros at the WHO, Dr. Ngozi at the World Trade uh, Association, uh, Dr. Natalia Kahnem at UNFPA. In addition to this big global institutions, we are seeing Africa emerging as a leader in this pandemic. So Dr. John Nkengesong, who heads Africa CDC, has galvanized the scientific and public health community on the continent. And, and recently, Africa CDC brought together over 40,000 delegates in a two-day virtual summit to discuss how to strengthen Africa's vaccine man manufacturing capabilities. Um, you've seen that he was also nominated uh, to lead PEPFAR that will now combine not only HIV AIDS work as it was intended when President Bush, George Bush established it, but also to include uh, pandemic preparedness and response. So that is leadership. And in December, the Africa CDC will host the first ever international conference on public health to allow African scientists, policymakers, and researchers to share their learnings and strengthen collaboration across the continent. So it's with this backdrop that all of us got super excited when we saw Dr. Nkengasong uh, was nominated to lead PEPFAR. Uh, as you know, uh, that is an institution with uh, over $8 billion annual budget that has had transformative impact regarding HIV AIDS care around the world. And he will be the first African uh, to hold this position. Why am I sharing this with you? Because these are drastic changes from the way global health has normally operated, where mostly white elderly men, no offense, have been mentored by many of them to get where I am but in the US and Europe have continued to lead and, 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 and uh, have been in charge. So I think these are the kind of signal that we are seeing uh, emerging out of George Floyd, emerging out of the Black Lives Matter movement, emerging out of the decolonization of global health movement. And in all our institutions, and especially in global health, it's so important for our global ex experts to be truly global. Um, so I'm deeply inspired by the leadership, resilience, and commitment that African leaders have shown in making this shift a reality. But however, this progress did not just happen overnight. It's the result of years and years of work to build a strong foundation piece by piece, step by step, and the result of global partnership, countless global partnership and collaboration um, as, as we know, for example, the University of Wisconsin has had a deep and profound partnership that is mutually beneficial and bilateral between institutions in Ethiopia that was led by Professor German, Professor Siraj, and so many others from the University of Wisconsin. So for me, what we need is really deepening that global partnership and collaboration in a mutually beneficial way. And as you can see, we are at that turning point. So we really, really should feel hopeful. But the existence of hope, hope, the existence of hope does not mean we can sit idly by waiting for the world to improve on its own. Um, I want you to think critically about 
what this hope will push you to reach for, to work for, and to fight for, right? What is your vision for an equitable world? You know, my, my vision has been, as I told you, looking at my life's journey and how I got here, my vision is one where women and girls have autonomy over their bodies, where a person's skill, skin color or where they were born does not determine their health outcomes or their opportunities in lives, where health services, including vaccines, are distributed fairly around the world, where countries are empowered to protect the public health of their own people, where global health leadership is inclusive and well distributed, where frankly an African medical student's voice hold the same weight as those of you in Wisconsin sitting in the room. It is clear that my vision is not representative of the world we live in today. And it's up to us to make that world, create this world in the future. So around the world, uh, foundations, governments, and institutions, and others are finding ways to step in and create that change, right? Some of the examples of this are the recent uh, European Commission announcement that has pledged a billion dollar to support local manufacturing and access to vaccines, medicines, and health technologies in Africa. Um, and that particular announcement will go to two countries, my own home, Rwanda and Senegal. So it's been incredibly exciting to see what would it take to get vaccine manufacturing, mRNA vaccine manufacturing that will not only fight this pandemic, but the technology can be applied to fight deadly diseases that have been neglected for centuries because they are there, right? Like we're worried about COVID because the virus transcended borders and came to our uh, back door, but diseases like, you know, neglected tropical diseases and malaria that countries and, and continents like Asia and Africa have lived with for a long, long time can be tackled through this initiative. We've seen civil society organizations around the world um, that have worked tirelessly to fill gaps uh, in essential services, distributing protective uh, gears and share health information. We've seen biotechnology and pharmaceutical companies um, developing safe and effective vaccine, safer than, you know, faster than ever. Uh, but that was built on years of research in the making, right? Like highlighting the importance of investing in research and development, even when we are not in the middle of crisis. So I truly, truly think academic and research institutions like the University of Wisconsin have a critical role to play in this efforts. And our actions have never been more important than this moment that, that we're in. But I also worry that we're missing this critical window. You know, as a, as a former full-time faculty and as a current adjunct faculty, at the University of Michigan, I see the struggles uh, play out. You know, one of the greatest challenges of academic medicine today is that our success is measured not by the lives we impact, but rather by the grants and publications we produce. And, you know, of course, this, this, this research and publications lead to big discoveries at times, but we struggle to connect our research to day-to-day -day measurable impact where we can ameliorate human suffering. Um, it is true the COVID-19 crisis significantly disrupted the regular flow of academic life. I mean, I know you st your struggles, conferences are canceled. The earlier days of the pandemics were quite hard and the financial consequences of the decisions made early in the pandemic, you know, such as postponing elective cases and surgeries have led to significant budget cuts and crunches. And I know faculty are asked to work longer hours, pause their travel, take salary cuts. So it is not like I don't understand your struggles. Uh, I know many academic institutions and universities across the United States put a moratorium on travel. But as we adjust to these new realities, what we are seeing is global research and global health collaborations are being put 
in the back burner. And I'm really worried that we will miss out. I mean, both in terms of having impact, but also that opportunity for core creation with our students, with our future leaders. So while this disruption have appended many parts of our regular life, they have also challenged us to work differently and learn how to operate in a, in, in a new way, such as you know, by leveraging technology like I'm, like I'm doing right now, talking to you from Kigali, we are able to connect more seamlessly with colleagues around the world. So we must, we, we have to and must use this momentum as an opportunity to fundamentally transform how we work in the long term, you know, for for in an institutions like yours, that means going beyond our historical role of researching and training residents. You know, I as you know, for example, I I, I was browsing and, and saw that the School of Medicine and Public Health and the Medical College of Wisconsin have committed three million dollars to study, measure, and recommend solution for health inequities in Wisconsin. Uh, but I urge you to think even bigger and extend such studies and such measurements and such recommendation to broader uh, global community. I truly believe building cross-country collaboration will be an essential, essential component of this, particularly as Africa moves to scale up its vaccine manufacturing capacities, research capacities, you know, an institution like you, yours and mine, Michigan and others have a very important role to play here. So we have to really think critically to say, how can we help train the next scientists and doctors? How do we share our expertise, but do so in such a way uh, it's not like, you know, Wisconsin is flying in to help Rwanda, but rather how do we co-create mutually beneficial research priorities that we can learn from, that we can collectively contribute to. And, and, and part of this process, frankly, is going to require us to show up with humility, which we haven't done very well in the past. I mean, those of us in the global north need to recognize there are many lessons we can learn from around the world. And th this is not a point, a point that I'm going to belabor at Wisconsin, because just in your, in your various departments, I know it may not be a university-wide effort, but there are multiple multiple collaborations and lessons to learn from your own institutions um, how that is done how do you set up uh, you know collaborative cross learning uh, you know partnership and I, I had alluded to, alluded to yesterday I'm sorry alluded to earlier about the collaboration um, Wisconsin has with University of uh, you know with Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia to improve health system and share knowledge through a global health twinning partnership. Right, so we are gonna need to have broader collaboration like this, um, you know, throughout the university, not just at yours, but throughout our, the United States, and 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 also asking ourselves, you know, what more can we do? How can we incentivize our leaders in academic institutions to prioritize global health research and partnership? One of the things I did when I was at Michigan is I co-led our um, pathway for medical students in global health uh, and equity so that they could do both global health work or focus on an equity you know, in Detroit or Ypsilanti. And we activate the students, they get so excited, they get a taste of what they could do. And then when they get to residency and fellowship or become a junior faculty, they don't find you know, as much support. So we really have to do significant advocacy to ensure that, you know, faculty have resources available to them to support themselves and students to be involved and, and contribute to global health equity. How can we ensure students learn lessons from these initiatives and apply them not just for their research, but throughout their career as physicians and as practitioners and as researchers and, and as individuals? we must commit to finding answers to these questions and advocate for policies and funding within our institution to put those answers into action. So in order to achieve the world we seek to create, uh, one based in equity, justice, and dignity, we must break down the borders that have shaped our society for so long 
borders between nations and the vaccine response, borders that separate opportunities and access for women and girls from those of men and boys, borders that have shown us Haitian immigrants trying to uh, cross the borders to come to the, to the United States face border patrol that are whipping them, you know, uh, while sitting on their horses instead of welcoming them and embracing them, you know, borders between us and them. This process will not always be comfortable. Change rarely is comfortable, but you must believe in your ability to be part of it. Uh, throughout the pandemic and up until very recently, you know, there were wishes and calls to return to normal. Um, I hope you have realized, as I have, that it has become clear that there is no such thing as a post-pandemic world that is fully normal. But going back to normal cannot and should not be the goal, frankly, because I described to you what we took as normal uh, pre-pandemic. Our normal was a world full of injustices. So we, I, I truly believe we now stand at a, at a frontier uh, if we learn from this moment we can shape a new future. You know, the virus knows no borders and neither should we in our work to overcome it. So let us take a step forward over the lines and usher a new era of global health equity. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you and I'll be happy to entertain any questions if your the audience has them. Great, well, thank you so much for a, a, an inspiring and impactful talk um, and I appreciate a uh, uh, beaming in from Wanda um, and uh, look forward hopefully to an in-person visit at some point in in whatever our future holds. Um, I will be while, while we are waiting for questions, um, I do I have a, a couple of questions and thoughts. So um, talking about the uh, the availability of vaccine in Africa, can you um, is it all simply supply? What are the other barriers for vaccinations in Africa? I mean, as you mentioned, US has supply, but our vaccination rates are not where we want them to be um, for a variety of reasons. So um, can you comment in Africa? Absolutely, thank you for that very insightful question. So I think the biggest challenge we have is supply. There is no issues around it. I mean, uh, sort of, you know, you learn lessons, right? And you try to course correct when the World Health Organization and Gavi and other multilateral institutions, um, you know, realize that Africa and, and other developing countries, whether it's uh, Tonga and the Pacific uh, West or Barbados, were going to have challenges accessing, they created a facility called COVAX that brought all manufacturers, member states to say, how do we equitably distribute to this limited resources, right? So in fact, because we believed in the system that this multilateral system will deliver, we asked countries to not enter into bilateral deals directly, right? So countries, high income, low income countries led by 20 representatives signed a deal and the deal was going to be everyone will procure through the COVAX facility. But I'm sure it doesn't come as shock to you. Why would the United States go through the COVAX facility, right? So developing countries are paying $5 per vial and the US is paying $20. And at the end of the day, you know, everyone is out there to protect their population's interest and there is nothing wrong with that. So the high income countries got hold of all the vaccines. The low income countries not only uh, couldn't get the vaccines, but they now have this deal they have signed that they can't enter bilateral deals. So if they try to go get a supply from Moderna or, or Pfizer, one is the chance of getting it is really low. But even when that is possible, the threat was that if you do that, you will dropped out of this facility. So supply has been the biggest, biggest, biggest barrier. Having said that, there are other challenges, right? There is a delivery challenge. You know, how do you roll out? But if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, I mean, we have the public health system. The reason why Africa managed the pandemic 
is not because miraculously all the things that you hear from our former head of state that like whether because we take malaria pills or we are used to all sorts of viruses, you know, part of it is giving credit where credit goes. And then, you know, populations of Ethiopia, 100 million, Nigeria, we have systems where we have fought and the public health systems are quite strong. We may not have advanced tertiary care services, but we know how to roll out vaccines using lady health workers who go door to door immunizing young children. So the delivery system was all its shortcomings is there. But as you know, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine require minus 70 degree refrigeration. So they could only be rolled out in big cities. So that's why the strategy for most African countries has been to vaccinate those in the cities, which are large populations, if the mRNA vaccines were available and then we'll use AstraZeneca and J&J to the rural population. So delivery is a challenge. The other challenge is vaccine misinformation. It is nothing like the United States where you have people that are committed to misinformation. I mean, I have never seen a society that just rolls out of bed and you know rolls not just in vaccine, but in so many aspects of our lives. Uh, we have groups for whatever purpose have decided to destroy our fabric by pushing misinformation. And some of that stuff gets imported, exported to, to, to Africa. And especially when they're linked to religious groups, um, they tend to come. We see it in women's rights. We see it in vaccine uh, misinformation. But it has not been the majority of the reasons why vaccines are not being rolled out. Frankly, right now, only like, you know, some of the countries, only a few percentage of their frontline, not just healthcare providers tend to do much better, but frontline workers, you know, service delivery, bus drivers, these populations can't access the vaccine. But the fact that the majority of, if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, 65% of the population is youth. So the elderly population is less than 3%. So as a result of that, as well as public health measures, we're not seeing the catastrophic death toll that we're experiencing in the United States and Sub-Saharan Africa, despite the lack of vaccines. Um, and then just to follow up on that, there's a question um, about uh, the challenges with vaccine elitism and preference for certain types. Uh, it, particularly if only one type is available in a country, are you seeing that as an issue? Yeah, no, that's what privilege looks like, right? I mean, <laughs> I uh, was in the US issues. recently and I'm like, uh, yeah, like, I, can I get it? I'm like, oh, they don't have Moderna. You know, I'm going to go to look for a place. No, I mean, people are taking anything and everything, including like Sinopharm, you know, the Chinese vaccine that has WHO approved, but has been shown to be much less protective for the Delta variant. So um, yes, uh, you know, if you have the luxury, you can choose. But for the majority of people in Sub-Saharan Africa, we've been trying to get our hands on anything and everything from cup and, you know, uh, fill and cup products in Brazil to AstraZeneca from the Serum Institute to Moderna and mRNA and the recent donations. Um, although the first batches up until uh, early this summer were mostly uh, AstraZeneca, uh, j and &J and Sinopharm, we recently are receiving um, some Pfizer doses uh, through the generosity of the United States. Um, I say that as a kind of jokingly as a taxpayer because I mean, it's, it's in our best interest to vaccinate the world, right? <laughs> We've seen that when, when the vi virus mutates, it's not sparing uh, people who've gotten two doses and the next mutation may not spare us even if we have a booster dose. So uh, while the generosity is welcomed and appreciated, I think it's not only the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. Great. Um, Dr. Siraj, did you have a question? Yes, if we have time. Thank you, Sanai. That was a great talk. Uh, and you clearly have articulated what the responsibility and moral obligation for the West is. I just want to flip the question also, because really this has to be asked. What is the responsibility of uh, African leadership and political system also to improve this issue? Because, you know, if you see, for example, Ethiopia, uh, the civil war that has unleashed in Ethiopia has derailed the system, really took us more than 20 years back in our public health uh, work that has been done for so many uh, years. So, so I know it is a very difficult question and uh, maybe even outside oh, it's of not this at all. <laughs> talk, but, but we really have to, as leaders like you, uh, 
what is what what is your uh, your thought on this? Uh, you know, Professor Dowd, this is not hard at all, right? I mean, this is common sense. Everybody has to come to the table with priorities and bargains. And what we've seen for a long time in Sub-Saharan Africa is health being left for development work and governments not putting their own resources and their money um, when it comes to big things. So and that's sort of the narrative. The truth is, if you actually look at healthcare expenditure as a whole, the majority of the money comes from countries themselves. It may not be directly from their treasury, it may come through highly subsidized uh, loans like IDA and IDRB and what have you. Money comes from them, but leadership matter, governance matter, and prioritization matters, right? So. Uh, if you look at countries around the world, from Ethiopia to Afghanistan, from Syria to Yemen, a lot of the destruction of healthcare services and facilities, what is setting us back is self-inflicted. It's, it's, it's leaders' uh, commitment to retain, staying in power, whatever it is that is driving them, and, and frankly, not prioritizing the best interest of their population. Uh, I know politics is complex, and I don't seem to have... Uh, any uh, you know deeper understanding of the space, but what I know is what we see clearly: the brunt of conflict is borne by individual, average, most vulnerable, and, and sadly, mostly women and girls. So conflicts disrupt; they they don't discriminate. They disrupt health services. So that is sort of one component. You know, what is the responsibility of a leader in Ethiopia or in Yemen and Afghanistan? to get out of conflict, start building back and, and, and focus. And you're absolutely right. We have made significant losses, not just in healthcare, but in economy in several aspects uh, due to the war in Ethiopia and in other parts of the world. Um, but the second is even when we are not in the middle of conflict, how do we prioritize research? How do we start putting whatever percentage of our income to advancing science, to research, to global collaboration, and, and, and that I think comes naturally as economists improve. I mean, if you have to make a choice between feeding your society and doing research, although answering the right question may help you, you know, uh, improve how to effectively feed your population, we tend to focus on what's at hand. But we're seeing, you know, for example, in countries like Brazil that has now put 2% of their tax income into research. And then how do we collaborate better? So kind of flipping back into my foundation hat, one of the things we're doing now is trying to flip the global health dynamic where money and resources, you know, when I was at the foundation, you alluded to this, I got $50 million in collaboration that came to me. Myself and my faculty decided how to allocate that money, how to travel, where it goes to. Now we're trying to flip that paradigm following the NIH, HRSA, MEPI partnership, how do we enable institutions in the global south by giving them resources and have them invite the partners they desire to collaborate with, to set goals? And, and we are doing that right now, it was working uh, with one of your colleagues at the Department of, Department of uh, Sur Surgery, the, the section chief for vascular, Professor Gurma, and uh, the American College of Surgeons, uh, the universities around the US and the government of Rwanda are collaborating around uh, both expanding surgical training, but also creating systems, strengthening health system. How do you set up a trauma system? How do you not only set up a system at this kind of point of healthcare delivery, but look at the pre-trauma care. What could you do to prevent someone from getting into an accident? What do you do when accident happens? And these are just incredible opportunities for both of us to engage to in research and in collaboration and, 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 and bringing some of the lessons back home, right? I mean, one of the very first things I learned when I started working in Ethiopia from the University of Michigan was I went to the OR to operate and you know, I'm used to like using 50 different kinds of stitches to do a C-section or or uh, or a myomectomy. And I go in and I see my colleagues doing like end to end with a, a 30 micro without wasting you know anything. So there are like systems efficiencies that we can learn from the global south, especially how in looking at how inefficient we've become, how expensive healthcare has become in the United States. I think there's just a lot that can be done and learned around uh, 
you know, implementation science to, to, to improve uh, effectiveness and efficiency of health systems. So, but your point is very well taken, Dr. Dowd, that uh, we can't build on one side if we're distracting on the other side. It ends up being a zero sum game. So we are, we are uh, just over time. I apologize, we haven't gotten to all of the questions, but I'm sure uh, Dr. Fassad would be delighted to um, have anybody email her um, for questions that come up. And I really want to thank you for uh, an inspiring and impactful um, talk and message. And um, you know, I think there's a lot of interest and excitement about trying to build uh, on our, our, what we have and to um, impact, impact the world. So thank you.